Welcome to this webinar regarding Visual Basic Function, VB function in Carlson Studio. This agenda, I will first do some introduction of through these ones, then look at the parameters in this function. It has only three parameters, but all of them may contain several items. Then we'll look at this U-bound function inside the script. You may send. I'll also show something about how to disable it while you're working on it. Like if you're working with a normal definition, uh, you always see the value of what you're typing underneath for an error message. That may be a disadvantage because the script is run each time you type a letter. So we'll go through that, how to disable that. Units. As you know, Visual Basic has no units, so we need to cope with that somehow. We'll show that. Also something about documentation. And an important part, if you have some sample code in Visual Basic and want to paste that into your definition, there's a special feature for doing that. I'll show that as well. Then a little bit a suggestion of debugging and some examples. The examples will come all the way. Actually, I will start with an example immediately. Even before this introduction, I would like to make a small VB function. As simple as it's possible to make it. Then I will also show the first problem you may run into, and that's actually that you're not allowed to use the Visual Basic function. I will show why and how. Here, my definition inside this variable. I simply type VB function. It will turn to capital letters. If I just give two types like this, meaning the separation between the parameters, then I give a script. And now I type some Visual Basic code and I say result equals 55, for instance. Like this. Then I get a message saying that VB function support has not been enabled yet. And the reason for that is that you have so much freedom with this function. You can read and write files. You can change some system files, depend on your privileges, of course. But if you are logged in as an administrator on your computer, you are actually able to use this script to put a virus into your computer copy a virus from the internet somewhere and put it into your computer. So to avoid that, we have this security system. So I say I want to continue here, but to cope with this, I need to go into my project settings on the menu or this button here, change product, project settings. Here on the advanced tab, we have the choice of enabling active content like VB function and so on. If I check that one, then this function is okay. You see the symbol for it? That's an exclamation mark, like we have a dice if using random functions and so on. This VB function is shown in the variable like this because it's a potential harmful function and it's a potential source of problems because it's living its own life, this VB script engine. I will come back to what this is. But just look at this one now. You see, I get the result 55. I can also show an auto report here. I get 55 here because of this script. And here I have said that I have no dimension. That's the first parameter. I have no expressions or parameters. I often call it here. That's the second one. The third one, that is a script. And that's a text. So I put it in quotes. And I see here that a variable in Visual Basic called result should be equal to 55. That's a special name that we may actually enter in the first parameter under dimensions. But before going through the intro introduction, I would also like to show how we can put some dimensions here. Currently, I do not have any dimensions. If hoovering here, 
you see the three parameters. They are dimensions, expressions, and scripts. In this example, I'm only putting something on script. And by some magical means, the value of this result variable becomes the value of my power sim variable now. I will explain why. First, I go here and say, I want a dimension on this one. I want this to be a small array, a vector of three elements like this, one to three. Then you see, I only get question marks back. That is because my magic variable result, it is now an array. It's not a single variable anymore because I have given a dimension to what I want to get out of this function. So therefore I have to index it. That's done with normal brackets in Visual Basic. And I put some value here. For instance, index number one, you think that will be the first, the second, or the last element. Think of it, you could type it now. It became the second element. Why? Why didn't this become the first one? Well, that's because all arrays you deal with in Visual Basic, they are zero based. So if I say array of zero element, then I get the first element here. I can also duplicate this. I say that element uh, number two, for instance, should be 455, like this. I will come back to what's happening here. But this is a very easy and simple Visual Basic script. Here I'm giving two commands. Maybe put some space in here, here maybe. I rather want to put them on separate lines, but just to, to show how this is built up. It's just a series of texts, one text for each command. We normally put them on separate lines. I put dimensions here, and in between, inside here, I can put some expressions or parameters. I will come back to that. Okay. What is actually happening inside this function? This VB function, it actually calls the Microsoft script engine on your computer. You may not necessarily have this script engine, but most, I guess, 99.9% .9 of Windows computers, they have it because it's installed with the uh, Internet Explorer and so on. So this script engine, receives these texts. And they are, it's just a programming language, 55 times two, for instance, and I get 110 here. I can do many things inside here. Mm. To be able to use this function, as I mentioned, you need to enable active content. That was on this project settings menu and advanced. That's important to know. Mm, this last parameter containing the script is the most important one. That's actually the script. But something more is happening than this. This result variable, for instance, that is something that's a variable. It's declared on behalf of this definition. Here we have defined that this result variable should have three elements. And they go from zero to two. But still, the script, the main script, usually containing many lines, maybe 100 lines in one function like this, because it's a small program you're putting in. And the entire program is put in through these text parameters. Um, one limitation of the Visual Basic function is that you only have one returning value. This returning value may be an array, so you may have many elements, but the the variable or or 
it's one object you're returning, and that's this array. It may have up to six dimensions, so it's usually not a problem, but you may need to do some tricks. Like, let's say you you want two arrays of uh, one to three, then you simply make a second array of uh, two elements, and you have those two arrays. But if you want one array of three elements and one array with one element, for instance, then you just need to do the same thing. You need a second dimension, and you just leave two of your elements unused when they come back, just the same way as I'm not using the middle element here now. The result of one, I've not given it a value. That's why we get the question mark. But still, it's a limitation that you only have this single returning value. On the other hand, in here, you can have as many input parameters as you want. I will show how to make an input parameter into this one. If I make a constant here, for instance, make a link from the constant to my auxiliary. This constant, say it equals five. You can uh, even put, uh, let's put the slider on it. Slider here, this constant. You see, I haven't used it yet. So how to use this constant? Well, I put it in here. I say first that a, a variable in Visual Basic, a variable that will be used in a script, this is still not the script. This is just a declaration of any expressions I would like. So I could say my, let's call it the C1, because it's a constant one. I don't have a better name for it now. C1 in my script should be equal to constant one. So now I've defined something saying that my Visual Basic variable C1 has this definition. Now it's really time to put this on several lines. So as you may know, I need to hold the control key to give new lines in Parson Studio. So I remove these spaces and rather put them on different lines. And I copy one of them. But I say this one should be result one that should be able to my C1 value. And now you see, I get five here because five is a value of constant one. Very simple. And I can put a comma and have other parameters here. Normally, actually, I would put that on a separate line as well and that one on a separate line. Here, the script starts. This is the section with all the parameters. That's why we need these tiles. We cannot use comma between the parameters in the Visual Basic function because each parameter may contain several sections. I may put a comma here, but I'm still on this expression parameter in Visual Basic function. So that's the difference between tiles and commas to separate parameters. Same in the for function, for instance. Okay, so now let's test this. Can I change this one? Yes, it works. I'm now changing one of the values inside my Visual Basic function. Let me continue a little bit on this introduction before I show more features here. Mm. It's useful for many purposes, but there are two main important ones that are most used and where, where you cannot, in many cases, do things in Person Studio, or you have to do it in a very inconvenient way. One of them is to loop through all elements in an array where each element is dependent on the previous element. You may have 10 elements, for instance, and a typical case is a cumulative sum, as we will show an example for. 
if you want to make the cumulative sum using definitions in Progressive Studio, you need to use two dimensions, even if you are summing only one. And that's, it's inconvenient, it's difficult to understand, and it's a bit uh, time consuming because you are using unused or unnecessary elements. So that's one very important usage of the visual basic function, making functions similar to the cumulative sum. Of course, you have the cumulative sum, so you don't need that one, but, uh, but you can uh, do loops like that. Another important usage is reading and writing text files. I will come back to examples for that as well. This script section of, uh, of uh, the Visual Basic function, that is transferred as text into this engine and it's interpreted. That is a bit heavy process for this engine to interpret this one. It's halfly compiled when we are changing it, but, but still you, it is time consuming doing this. So sometimes you still want to make a visual basic function of your case, but you may want to go on to using custom functions. We'll have a webinar on that later, but uh, a custom function is much faster. That's compiled C++ code. So it's extremely fast, just as fast as the built-in functions inside Parson Studio. Still, if you want to make a bit complex custom function, then you can also use VB function to make a prototype for your function. Check that this works, that your, your mathematics are correct, then you don't care if it's a bit slow, but when you then want to do the real model, then you're converting it to a custom function. And that's very easy if you have your source in the Visual Basic and you can use that to make your C++ code. That makes it much easier. Okay, then back to these parameters. I will rephrase and do a small change here. VB function, it has three elements, or uh, sorry, three parameters. And the first one here is dimension. What I've shown here is simply to use dimension. And as you see, this dimension has influence on the resulting variable, this one. So now by putting three elements in here, I get three elements in my result variable. So dimension influences result. Actually, it could also influence the name of this variable. Maybe you want it in another language. Maybe you want to shorten it. Maybe it takes too much space. You could just fit it in somehow in some code, I don't know. But you need to shorten the length of this variable. That's a typical thing you may want to do. And you could do that here in this first parameter. I could say r equals one to three. Same way as I define a parameter, but now I say r equals this one. And then I get some type mismatch on my result because result is no longer an array in Visual Basic. Because it's now the name of this variable is r. So if I change to r here, then we have the same functionality. And if it is more or less readable now, that's something you can judge yourself. But uh, anyway, I have shortened it down. So it's less text to transfer. And of course, it still works here as it did. So this is all you can do in this first uh, parameter. Can of course have several dimensions. But you, you put the name of the resulting variable and you put the dimension for it. Okay. Then this second parameter, you have already seen it. It's called not parameters, but expressions. 
that's because we can put anything here. Let's uh, make another parameter or expression that we put in. I call it the TS for time step. I want something that counts my time steps. Okay. Then I say this one should equal time minus start time. Some spelling problem here. If I do that, then I get a, some some uh, amount of time, a certain number of seconds. But I want to count the time steps. So therefore, I divide that time by time step. The function time step. And in place of showing 455 as the last element here, I show this TS. Zero, I get there. That's because I'm on the start of the simulation. If now stepping forward, you see I'm counting the time step number. Third time step, fourth, and so on, starting on zero. So the middle one has this one, and so on. All of this, of course, I could do in a normal variable without using any visual basic, but I'll soon come to, to what we only can do here. Okay. The last parameter is a script. And as I have shown you here, I recommend putting the script like this, a quote on each side and so on. You could skip the quotes, you could put them on the same line. If you skip uh, the quotes except the first one, put all in one long string, then you may have some coloring problems uh, and it may be confusing typing. And so that's not the default way of doing it. Also, if you use this paste as VB string, VB script string, then, then you will get quotes before and after each line you're trying to paste in. I will show that later. Okay. One more thing which is important when working with arrays in Visual Basic function, and very often when you need it, you need it for arrays. That's this U-bound function. That's a very useful function. It's a function added by PowerSim, actually. PowerSim gives the ability to ask how many elements do we have in this R, for instance, or in constant one and so on. If constant one had been an array, I could also ask that one for how many elements does it have. So I will show now, in place of 55 times two, I will show here what the u-bound function gives as a result if I say u-bound of r. Then you see I get the value 2. I do not get 3, I get 2. That's because it starts on 0, the element, so 2 is the upper bound, so u is for upper, upper bound of this or of the indices you need in this uh, array. So that value two is very useful if you want to make a loop going through this one. And making a loop in Visual Basic is actually very simple. I will show. I say simply for uh, no no brackets, sorry, I will use the power same. It's say for and an index variable, i for instance, um, equals, and as I'm typing now, you see, I get lots of error messages here. Maybe I want to see those error messages, but sometimes if I'm in the middle of making some kind of loops or similar, and then I, by mistake, or not even by mistake, but for some reason, I get a very long loop, let's say a billion elements, a billion uh, in, uh, revolvements, then it will hang. 
course, it may spend uh, three hours to do the, that billion uh, loop uh, cycles. So sometimes I want to disable my Visual Basic function for a while. And a very simple way of doing that is simply to break this uh, name of the function. Putting a D for disable, for instance, whatever, put something in, then I can type with the same error message all the time that this name is not recognized. Okay? So I say I goes from zero to two. Like that. Inside this one, and I prefer to invent it. And I say that R of I should be able to, for instance, uh, I times uh, three. I'm using this index only. And at the end, I put next. When I'm finished doing that, then I should apply, say continue anyway, then save the file. I won't save this one, I haven't chosen a name. But you should normally save it in case you still have an eternal loop here. And then when you're finished, you can remove this dummy D inside here. And now you see we got the value zero, three, and six, because I went from zero to two, which are the elements of my array. What if I change now to go from one to five, like that? What happens? My loop still only goes zero, one, and two, because I didn't use the U-bound function. I should use U-bound. I replace two by upper bound of my resulting variable. Then I get all the numbers, regardless of what dimension I get in here. Very useful. Okay. I will now, before taking units, I would like to show the file I'm going to send you. Here I'm erasing all my examples. I have another file here. Um, this one, VB function demo. Here you see this one. That's a very simple one. Here I've used R equals no dimension. I didn't do exactly this. This may look a bit strange, but on this one, on the dimension parameter, I've only said that I want R to be my resulting variable. R equals two, three, four. And R has no dimension. That's why it equals nothing and it ends there. There, this tile comes. Here, I have one parameter. The visual basic name of the parameter is in this case, para for parameter. And I say R, which is the resulting one, equals two times para. So here, you see, I can, uh, I can change this one and I get twice the value out of the function. Then for arrays, I have the same simple variable. And I do the same thing here. Para multiplied by two gives the same value as in the previous one. One, nine, 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 and a parameter plus two in the end. Five plus two is seven. Five times two is 10. Whatever you like. The same function as this one, I've shown the non-recommended ways of doing it. This looks messy. Put it on one single line. A bit less messy if you put some spaces here. But still, it's messy. Also, this one. You see here, I could put a quote before and a quote after. And this is the text. But the prob problem of doing that is, for instance, if I retype one there, you see the colors are changing. Because 
this is a scripting world. When we put new lines, Parsim gets confused to be able to handle the highlighting because Parsim doesn't know if this is a Parsim equation or a VBScript equation. It's uh, in some cases, I will show you, you can even have this problem when using quotes on all lines and pasting, just in a moment you're pasting. But that's why we we prefer using double quotes on both of them. Two small examples on that. Then, here is a bit more complex example than the one I did show. Here, I don't say that R is uh, one to three or similar. I say it's a dimension of the first dimension of this variable. This is a function, you can use it in four functions, whatever. The function dim is equal to, for instance, one dot dot three, or the name of an enumerated range or similar. So it's a very nice function in, in lots of cases. So here in this function, I say my returning value should be the dimension of this one. And you see this variable goes from two to 10, not from one to 10, but two to 10. And it has some function just to give some values. And the reason for going from two to 10 here is to emphasize or demonstrate that still, no matter if it goes from one to 10 or from 1980 to 1990, whatever, then you should start this loop on zero. It always starts, or almost always, it starts on zero when you're dealing with arrays in Visual Basic. So here, element number zero is element number two in the result, because that's the first one. And the first one is always zero. It's actually very simple and you don't need to think of it. And this U bound function, of course, takes care of that. So U bound in this case has a correct value to cover all your elements. So a pretty hassle-less function to use this U bound. From zero to U bound, always use that one if you don't have a very good reason to do it otherwise. So in this case, I just add the value 100. And you see, I have 100 more than the value we, we put in, in these elements. Very simple. Then we come to this example of the cumulative sum. That's the first example, which is actually worth a little bit. It's worth a bit because it's difficult to make that function in another definition. But it's still worth nothing because you have this function cumulative sum. That function is also a powerful one. And I will first explain what's going on here. The value we get out is the sum of all values until the current element. So for instance, on the second element here, we get the value of two plus one is three. Then on the next one, we have the sum of all this, or you could say three plus three is six. Six plus four is 10 and so on. That's a cumulative sum. So if I change one of them to zero, for instance, you will see I have two threes here. See it better if you set another one to zero as well. That's a cumulative sum. And how to make that in Visual Basic? Well, it's as simple as this. Of course, here we also need the same dimension out as we put in. We need the parameter. Here I use a function dim because I need the temporary variable inside Visual Basic. I don't actually need it. I could have skipped this one, but it's nice to show what variables I'm using inside my function. Then I set the starting value to the sum. I say it's zero. And then I start a loop, 
going through all elements. And it's as simple as saying the sum equals the sum plus my parameter. Parameter here, one. So zero plus one is one. That's what I get there. I also put the result here to one. So my resulting array kind of remembers the current value of the sum. Then I can erase it and use it for the next element when I come to two. And sum equals one is the previous one plus two is three. That's what I get there. And it continues like that. Very simple function. Okay. That's the entire function. It's a bit fun working with, uh, with Visual Basic as well. Even if this is something we already have, it's a very good example of a common usage of Visual Basic function. But then, what about the units? How can we utilize units inside Visual Basic? I have made um, a copy of this one. Here we have the same cumulative sum. But in this one, I want to, to change my variable here. I want this variable not to be, have the value one, two, three, four, five, and so on, but I want it to have a unit. What happens if I put, for instance, centimeters here? I multiply this i by one centimeter, like this. Uh, I also, yeah, I need to reset to, to get this value uh, reset. I had went a few time steps. That's why it didn't change the value. But now, you see, I have one centimeter, two centimeters, and so on. What do I get here? I, I could say, well, if we look at it, it is actually the value in meters, but it doesn't say meters. It just says 0 0.01. We know that's if that's a me, 0 0.01 meters is one centimeter. So you could say this is uh, somehow a correct value, but it's also very wrong because I want to see this as centimeters, not as a unitless value. And I'm confused. The reason for getting this in meters is that meters is the SI unit used here. We could look into, into the unit definitions centimeters is defined as 100 of a meter and meter is defined as the SI unit. I know that and therefore I could understand this, but it's, this is not acceptable at all. So we need to do something here. And the recommendation, I have two simple recommendations here. First of all, in, in most cases, you want the same unit out as you put in. Then you need to start by, by making this unitless, what you put in. So I say here, I divide this by one centimeter, like that. Then I have a unitless value coming in. So you see now, I get the output in something I could say is centimeters, but still it doesn't say that. So it's still not acceptable what I get out here. So I need to multiply by the same value as I divide by in here. Like this. Done. I'm to some extent satisfied. This could have been something being having influence from a variable lots of steps before. 
now it's on a variable one step before, but this could be the origin of something coming from from a variable in another submodel, for instance. This could be something you have in uh, in a component, perhaps. So you want to make it general. Maybe you don't know what what uh, unit comes in here, but you have to handle that manually in here. But let's say now I change this unit. I say I don't have one centimeter, two centimeters. So I have one meter and two meters and so on. What happens then? I rescale to get this one. Actually, I I get centimeters out. And I get 100 centimeters for one meter. Well, that's correct. In this case, it works. But that's only because I'm lucky because the unit I changed to is compatible with the unit I'm expecting to get in here. I'm expecting to get centimeters. I get meters. And in that case, it's actually OK. One meter divided by one centimeter, that's a unitless value of 100. And that is multiplied by centimeters. So that's why this works. But still, I may be, I may not have that luck. For instance, if this is a value in days. One day is a time unit. The SI unit is seconds. And you can understand what happen, what happens then. See, I get, I get this value in number of seconds. Or is it milliseconds? Whatever it's, uh, I get at for sure this is not eight million centimeters. This cumulative sum of one day, it's absolutely not centimeters. So this is wrong. And what what do I actually have here? If I highlight this one, that's a very nice person feature. I can hover it with the mouse, and I see the value of that single array. And you see the unit of it is days per centimeter. Of course it is. I put in days and I divide by one centimeter. But Visual Basic doesn't know that. There are no units in Visual Basic. So I need to do one more trick to be able to handle units like this. That trick is simply to say zero plus this value. Now you see I get an error message. And that's what I want to get. I don't want that to work because I need to go in here and change the unit which is expected into that uh, Visual Basic function. So if I go back to centimeters here now, then everything works fine. Rescale, that's fine. I can also change to meters as long as it's compatible, it's okay. One centimeter, 100 meters. But in a moment, I change this to days, then I get an error message on this one. And that's what I want to get, because it's not correct what I'm doing here when those units are not compatible. And this is, it's a very nice trick, simply to add zero to your input parameters to the Visual Basic function. Because then you're sure you, you can deal with this. In some cases, I put this value in, a, in an external variable that I'm using. This is, a, I can put a normal studio variable here and here, in cases I often need to change them. And then I simply change the value there. And the output will then be in centimeters if that's possible. If it's not possible, then I, I need to change it. As simple as that. Of course, in this case, when using days, I got 8 million as a value. We, we see that that's wrong as well. We have to see it's wrong here that we are not getting any values out. And we would easily see it with that 8 million. 
But if the if the mistake was, for instance, a change between US dollars and euros, then you might not have noticed the difference. Then your Visual Basic would say euros, for instance, but you actually put it in in dollars, and you would need a conversion between there. But you didn't have it, and you may get wrong results. That's why this is maybe tip number one of uh, undocumented tips in Parson Studio. Always add zero, or almost always add zero to your uh, parameters in Studio. So here, of course, in this case, I would most certainly want days here. So I should change this one to days and days. Then everything is fine. Okay. Then, if you need some documentation, what are you able to do in Visual Basic? Then the easiest thing is to search the web. And to do that, you simply search, for instance, uh, VB script, uh, read text file, for instance. Then you may have several hits, and uh, one of them may be your, uh, well, actually in this case, I didn't find any anything on MSDN. What I was looking for here was uh, MSDN. Uh, normally, let's say just text file them. This is amazing. Mm. Normally, you would uh, you would hit something on um, on MSDN, but in this case, I didn't. Read the script. Let's just say text. Because what I've written here is that uh, that you should uh, you should choose the MSDN Microsoft Com hits you get, and I had the opinion that you always get that, but ah, uh, oh, I see the error. <laughs> I misspelled it. Let's see R if then I guess we'll get something on. Uh, <laughs> no. Text file. Yeah, maybe we should put it here. I get something on MSDN. Sorry for that hassle. If you hit something on MSDN, that's most probably where you will get the help you need. But this, uh, this W3 schools, uh, is also useful. It has lots of languages, so you may need to search for uh, VB script. Uh, but you, you and there are always always others as well, TechNet and uh, this uh, Stack Overflow and so on. There are lots of forums. You can find lots of information. But let's go in here now. Here, we find something about opening a text. Then you have a text stream, open text file you can use. Um, you use a file system object. Maybe you need to search for that one and so on. You can search for all this. Here, for instance, you see that the constant when opening a text file, if you want to open it for reading, you use one. For writing two and for appending, you write eight. These are constants we should use inside the script. So I will show you a bit more about that. Here is a small example as well, how you can, uh, can do some programming. I would like to jump directly to, to the example here, where I'm reading from a file. In this VB script, I just say, Result is a returning variable, and it's a one scalar value. I want to read one number here. Should I read an array, many lines, and so on? But this is uh, 
it's simple but complex enough to understand what's going on. So I'm using this create object of the scripting file system object. That's described in the examples and so on. Then I define a variable, a string variable called file name. And I use this path. What you see here is that there are some backslashes inside my script. And that's each time I use a double quote or another backslash, then I need to put the backslash before it to avoid the power sim to think that we are ending this string parameter that we're using to transfer this script. I will show you this case as VB string thing very soon. But, uh, but for now, just accept it that this is actually one backslash and the, uh, Sorry. This here, that is one double quote inside. So to define a string inside Visual Basic, you need one double quote before the string and one after. This is the one after. The last one is to tell PowerSim that this line is finished. It may look a bit confusing in the first place, but it's not very complex actually. Then here you see this for reading equals one. That's what we saw on the page. Then before starting to try to read and open a text file, I'm first testing if the file exists. File exists is one of the functions we have on this file system object. So I'm using my object here, FSO, that's an object containing the file system object. And then I can use this function. So this is a way of accessing many functions. I pass this file name, so I'm checking if this file exists. For now, I know it is not. I put this on the clipboard and I go to my, uh, to my um, explorer. Here you see this file does not exist. I want to create it here very soon. But first, I want to continue and see what's happening here. Here you see it checks if the file name exists. It doesn't. So then it goes down here and puts minus one into the result. That's what we get now. So now I want to create this file. And if I do that, then this will happen. Then it will open the text file for reading, I'm just using this prompter, so I could, could have put just a number one here. But this makes it more readable. Then I read one line from file. Then I close the file, regard it, less if it is uh, more lines there. Um, and I put into my resulting variable zero plus, this is a bit similar to what I did on the input parameters, but this is to, to get an error message. If this is not, um, if this is a text, not a number, then I will get an error message when trying to add a value and this one. So that's why we have it here. It's a completely different purpose. You can do it the way you want. But here I put, or I pick out the mid string I start from the first position and take 10 characters. That's to be able to have some text right of this number further out on the line, as long as I keep it away. Uh, so I have 10 characters for the number. So I'm reading the 10 first characters and put that into the result as a number. Of course, I'm using this zero. Okay, that's it. Let me show when we are doing that. So I go in here again. I say I want to create a new text file. I use this name of the text file. I open it by double clicking it. Then I get this one, it is empty. And I put some number here, like that. I save it and I close it. 
then you see I still have minus one here because this function doesn't know that I have changed something on my directory. So I need to recalculate this one. One way of doing that is pressing the, the uh, reset key. Okay, then you see I read the number I have here. Very easy and simple. Let me show another function. We're soon running out of time. This one also reads a value. But let me go back and delete this file again. I delete it. So I reset now. You see it's minus one. Here I have a variable saying OK to create. That's a bool variable. A bool variable can be used directly into Visual Basic, but it will become zero or one inside Visual Basic. So here it's the same until I get to the else statement, meaning if the file name does not exist, then I'm checking this if create new. That's this one, okay to create. That's the policy name. That is a Visual Basic name. If that one is true, then I open the file for writing. I create a text file. And I put some value in here, 1814. I put some text right of it and something else. Let's see what's happening here. If I hook this one, you see now there are no, no text files except that one. That's another one. So I click this one and turn it back. Then you see here the text file is created and it got here 1814 value to read and so on. Very nice. This one created the file. It could have created a virus. Creating a, an executable file, then it shouldn't be a text file, of course. But that's why we have this uh, this uh, security issues on it. I could say here that I want to create a new file and overwrite it anyway. This one here, it's a very simple one. I create the text file and so on. Here, I do not have a condition inside Visual Basic, but I put the condition outside the entire VB function. And this is important. Sometimes, if you are able to do it this way, meaning you run the entire VB function if this condition is true. You see, currently it is false, so this will not be run. And of course, I don't want to damage my file unless I choose here to do it. This is a push button. So if I hold this one like this, then you see I have the value one on the VB script and I release it, then it goes back to false. If now opening this one, you see I got a different value here, created by this variable. Okay, very useful function. What if you didn't have that one? You have another script. I'll do this very quick. You can do this yourself as well. But here in this documentation, there is a normal VB script. You see there are no quotes at the end. There are quotes on this right line. I need quotes on the text to put in. Here I want to put 1942 into a new file. If I copy this to my clipboard, then I go in here and I say here, I do not paste it by using control V. So I right click and say paste as a VB string. You see then these quotes are added. These backslashes are also added. So I got two backslashes there, for instance, in place of the single one I have here. Very useful. You can paste it in. Should delete that one. But I, I won't do this now because I want to keep that one for you. I will send you this file. One last thing to show. If, uh, if you have a file here, um, it's the same file we're trying to open. But here we have a bool called append to file. 
and a value called appended value. That's these two variables, the appended value, and whether I want to append to it or not. Let's first look at uh, this one. Currently, it's 42, 42. That's a value to read and some other lines. Let's see what happens if I put this one to five, for instance, and I turn this one on and off again. Let's open the file now. And I got 42, 42 plus five is 42, 47. That's, uh, that's a functionality we put in here. And appending to a file, the reason for putting this into the example is that that's something you may want to do on each time step, for instance. You want to append some value to a file, maybe to a CSV file, then you can open it in Excel very easily. And you have full control of what values you put in, how you put them, and so on. You can even write it without having Excel installed on your computer and send that file to someone, and they can open it. Very useful. So the script here is simple. I make it some values and so on. I write this uh, string. And I open and, and write it, close it. And I also set the result of this one to the sum of values. So inside this one, sorry, here, if uh, turning this one on and doing many changes here, like that, and opening the file, you see I've got one value for each of them. If I drag this one, ooh, then I get lots of changes. And on each recalculation of this one, then I get one extra line in the file. Now, this is a very long file. Then it is useful to have the ability to delete it. That's what we do here. Now, I deleted it and replaced it. Of course, I can, um, if I have a long file like that, then I can open it, change this one, 124242. 42. I save this file, close it, and continue changing here. And you see that's inference here as well, of course. But one very last problem, Sorry for going over time before we stop. You see this one, for instance, the last time this variable was updated, that was when the file didn't exist. And no one has told this variable to be updated. It would update if I reset. It would update if I go one step or maybe not. <laughs> uh, I guess it will not let me try that. Yeah, you see, I can go a step ahead and still this one is not updated, not until I reset the model. The reason for that is that it has no reason to be updated. If I want it to be updated on each time step, then I need to put a dummy parameter in here. For instance, uh, D for dummy equals time. So put that as a parameter, then you see it reads from the file. If I go in here and change this value again to an even higher number, save it, then go back to the model. You see going one step now will update this value because I'm using the time parameter. But Let's change it again. I go down on this value, 24242, two, 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 like this. Save and close. You see, when I change this one, this one is still not updated. What if I want this one to update both in case I advance one step because the file may have been changed? I also want it to update when I change this one. Well, in that case, it's as simple as making a dependency here. In addition to this one, I say that my dummy2 equals 
this variable. I won't use it in the script, but just to make a dependency here. I use that one. And now you see, when changing this one, this one will be updated. I need to change it to prove it. So let me do that. I go back to 4242, like this. And now you see it's still not updated, but if I change this one, then I also updated that one. Very useful. So, Do you have any common questions for this? Let me quickly rephrase this agenda. Actually, what I've not done now is debugging. And the way to debug when you're, you're using uh, scripting, first of all, you may have some error messages here. Let's say um, we have some uh, some kind of error. For instance, um, we make an error here. I do it here in place. Um, I say that this uh, file name and e, for instance. Yeah, and I need the quotes, uh, the backslashes, like that. Here, I got an error. I get the VB script runtime error. This error is shown while I'm trying to change the script. If I now go in here and continue anyway, now I get a question mark because it couldn't evaluate this. But next time I go in here, I will not see the error message. And that's because I haven't changed the script. So that's rule number one when trying to find an error. You need to make a change to the script. So if I make a change here, then you see the error message comes. That's because this, uh, it's two different worlds. Then to fix this problem, of course, I, I, just, uh, I just erase this part. Then I read the value again. The other way of doing debugging is simply to use this writing facility inside your script. You should make a, a kind of debug file and do as we do here. This section, write line to the file and write, here you can write variables, you can write whatever you want into your debug file. Then you can see, first of all, how far you get in the script before it may stop or something. You can also see what values you have if you need to inspect the values inside a loop, for instance. It's very useful. Then you need all these lines. You need to, to open a file for writing, for reading was one, for writing or uh, was two, and for appending, which you will need there, is eight like we did in uh, in the other file here, in uh, this one, we had a pending. Here I've also referenced where on the internet you can find this. So uh, then to append to, to the file, you simply open it for appending, write something to it and close it. It's important to close it, otherwise you will have an open file and you, you don't want that. So that's the way you need to do it for debugging. If you do custom functions in C++, debugging is much easier. That's another chapter. Okay. I see some of you say you lost the video of me, but I, uh, I can see myself. So um, I'm not much to look at. <laughs> so um, uh, I hope you, you will be able to utilize this uh, VB function, and uh, I hope it's uh, it's okay to stop the webinar here.
if you have any questions, you should come with it now. So have a nice day.